So good afternoon and welcome uh, to this meeting of the Helsinki Plus 50 process on uh, enhancing the implementation of uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 across the OSCE region, uh, focusing on parliamentarians' contribution to women, uh, peace and security. Uh, let me say by way of introduction, and as uh, we're about to be joined by the President and the Secretary General for their introductory statements, uh, that uh, the perspective of our debate is, of course, that of the 50th anniversary. So uh, uh, we should have a discussion uh, keeping in mind, uh, uh, first of all, what should be uh, the message that the Parliamentary Assembly uh, will, uh, uh, in a way, put forward when it comes to uh, Resolution 1325 uh, in, uh, uh, on the occasion of the anniversary, the 50th anniversary. But also, what can we achieve in the meantime? So, what can we show in terms of progress that has been made uh, already to uh, to meet some of uh, some of the principles? And of course, we are moving in this broad perspective of implementation contribution of the OSC as a regional organization uh, to the implementation of uh, the sustainable development uh, goals. There are many good examples. Uh, of uh, uh, what the organization is doing in this, uh, in this field. Uh, first of all, the work of the dedicated structures in the uh, secretariat on the governmental side, uh, the activities of the institutions, uh, which in many different ways uh, um, uh, provide a strong contribution to uh, the implementation of the OSCE area of this, uh, of this resolution. Uh, but also a very large range of activities uh, by our own uh, uh, field operations. Uh, and I think it, this would be also a good opportunity to hear also from some of the speakers, uh, to hear examples of, uh, of this. Uh, overall, there is a strong effort of mainstreaming gender co considerations in all uh, uh, projects and all activities of, uh, of the organization. But of course, uh, it will be important for us to focus specifically on how parliamentarians can uh, contribute and, uh, and think on, uh, uh, from the perspective of the uh, as members of the, of the parliaments and members of the U.S. Parliamentary Assembly, uh, your role in uh, uh, promoting uh, these, uh, uh, these principles in your own parliaments, uh, taking into account best practices, good examples, things that have been done successfully in other uh, uh, context in other in other places. So the uh, advantage and the, the interest of events like this is also that of uh, uh, informing each other of uh, uh, of positive uh, of positive stories. As I was uh, uh, speaking the other day in the ESRC, the annual security review conference, I mentioned myself, for example. I see uh, President Setterfeld is uh, joining us now, so I will. Uh, stop uh, uh, at this point this uh, uh, introductory um, uh, consideration introductory statements uh, and I will uh, be glad to uh, give the floor to the president and then to uh, Secretary General Montella uh, for their own uh, considerations and then we'll hear from the panel, a panel with uh, um, uh, very uh, high level uh, participants, uh, uh, examples and experiences in uh, different uh, areas from activity of the, of the organization. So, President Sadefeld, uh, you have the floor for the opening debate. Thank you very much for joining us live here again. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sanier. It's my pleasure. Dear fellow parliamentarians, dear colleagues, dear participants, and thank you very much for joining us today. I hope that you have had the opportunity to rest during the summer, and that you are ready to continue participating actively in the work of the OSCE PA. I am glad to have the opportunity to connect directly from the new liaison office in Vienna, and I can assure you, it's really beautiful here, and it looks to be a good working place for the members of the Secretariat. I thank our Secretariat staff based here for their work and for putting events together. I am in Vienna since Monday, accompanied by Secretary General Roberto Montella to participate in the World Conference of Speakers of Parliament. 
And on Monday, last month, this Monday, it was also the conference, World Conference of Women Speakers of Parliament. And we were 26 women there, and it was the most fruitful dialogue and de debate. Uh, and I would also like to congratulate a special representative, Heidi Frey, who made a very good statement on the work on the gender issue in our CEPA and uh, the situation after the COVID. And uh, I think this was also a very important issue when it comes, comes to the parliamentarians' contribution to women, peace and security. Uh, and uh, at the summit of the women speakers of parliament, uh, they were a part of uh, combating the COVID-19 pandemic and discuss ways to consolidate these achievements in the future. Uh, from our CEPA, we have had this issue already on the agenda during the whole COVID period, and we have to continue this work as it's a very important security matter. The disparities laid bare by the pandemic will redouble our efforts to promote greater gender equality. This must be part of our responses. On many fronts, including in addressing security issues in the OSCE area. Last year, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the adoption of UN Security Council 1325, which underlined the central role of women in conflict prevention, management, and resolutions. Coming from Sweden, I am proud that the country has all has early on adopted national action plans to strengthen the agenda on women, peace, and security. The Swedish government agencies now include a gender perspective in all their projects, and we have a significantly increased funding for women's organizations working for peace. And I know, uh, as you also are aware, is uh, gender equality and uh, women's participation also a very important uh, part of the Swedish uh, chairmanship for OSCE. And uh, let me just mention that the Swedish foreign minister, Anne Linde, uh, is also speaking about this everywhere. And uh, I am very proud to say that uh, the Swedish foreign minister has just replaced the former, former, former Swedish minister who also was a woman. And I hope that this will result in a strong ministerial decision in December. This would also build on the pioneering work undertaken by Dr. Heidi Fry to keep focus on gender issues within the OSCE. Let me use this opportunity to remind you that her 2021 report was released last month and she light on the growing violence against women in two public fields, journalism and politics, both online and uh, offline. And uh, this is very much in line with what uh, the Women uh, uh, Speaker Summit also mentioned. It's uh, an increased level of not only physical uh, violence, it's also in assaulting, it's about threatening of women politician. And we celebrate, but I would also like to mention that there is a lot of things to celebrate. As we celebrate the achievement of the past 20 years, the rights of women remains under threat, but it's also quite a lot of steps forward. Uh, and uh, I think we have to protect this and find ways forward. And I say this, because it's a worrisome situation in Afghanistan, we have to really support that girls can continue to go to school, that women can continue to earn their own living. Otherwise, there will be step back. But closer to our homes, 
we have also to remain vigilant. We have to strengthen efforts to protect women, and we must speak up in support of victims wherever they may be. Our parliamentarians, as parliamentarians, we can champion the policies and those that prevent gender-based violence and contribute to women, peace, security, and agenda. We can make laws, but this is not uh, enough. We do also have to make awareness, to speak out, to request statistics. We have to request follow-up and also to demand changes if it needed. It is only by entrenching these values that we can truly progress towards greater gender equality. And I thank you all again for attending this meeting today, and I look forward to our discussions. And thank you once again, uh, Ambassador Sanier, for this event, as it's a very important step forward for OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, and by this also for our citizens in the member countries. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. And now, Secretary General Montella. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Congratulations, Ambassador. I really would like to commend you and the 16 uh, aficionados, I would say, those who are uh, always participating in these initiatives of the call for action. I think we have really devised a place in the OSC uh, asset where we can discuss issues of the CAF, really enter into the merit of uh, many of the questions that sometimes are more difficult to be discussed in the formats uh, which require also sensual language. But I really appreciate uh, the uh, participation of all uh, all of you. Uh, we will do more of these initiatives. I hope soon we'll also have uh, some of these initiatives in person. But I really would like to commend your efforts, Ambassador. Uh, and uh, here uh, I would like to raise uh, uh, the uh, point that this issue about gender equality and enhancing the role of women in peace and security, I know it's an issue very much at heart of many of our members. I see here connected uh, um, um, Eddie Fry, a special representative on gender issues, also Kari Eriksson in the past has uh, brought these issues very much. The Swedish chairmanship has made this uh, an important uh, point of uh, their chairmanship. We fully support these priorities in the Parliamentary Assembly. Rather than just pontifying on these issues, we actually want to implement uh, these issues. Uh, and uh, for uh, my area of responsibility, we'll try to implement it as much as possible at the secretariat uh, uh, level. Um, I am glad that there is also the uh, chief of the um, um, Conflict Prevention Center, Ambassador Tula, uh, Irola, and uh, Ambassador Bush. I know this is an issue very much close to your uh, delegation, and there's been ongoing discussions also with the Secretariat and the possibility to have uh, within the Parliamentary Assembly uh, an enhanced uh, um, discussion or uh, maybe even a project uh, to discuss women uh, and uh, enhancing their role in uh, issues of peace and security. I just uh, don't want to take too much of your time because uh, there are many uh, authoritative speakers who will speak in the panel. I just want to quote uh, the former special representative on mediation, Ilka Kanerva, former CIO and former president of UACPA. He said that women's participation in mediation efforts uh, is a matter of equality. However, it has a practical side too. By embracing gender inclusiveness in mediation, we are able to bring a perspective of both genders into the peace process, contribute to a more comprehensive peace agreement, and accordingly strengthen the prospects of forcing peace. I think uh, it couldn't be said better. I mean, this is uh, kind of the key also that we have within the LNCPA. So I don't want to take too much of your time, Ambassador. I leave you to carry the meeting. But again, congratulations and thank you very much for those. Uh, who are participating, our members, but also our colleagues from the Secretariat. Uh, I see uh, former directors of the ODIRS and other uh, members who are participate often in these meetings. We will do more of these, and I think uh, we have really an opportunity from now until Helsinki 2025 uh, to uh, try to strengthen this organization, to have this organization very high in the top priority of those who own this organization, the foreign ministers and the a higher level in the political leadership of uh, the 57 countries. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and good luck to us. Thanks, thanks to you, Secretary General. Thank you again, uh, Madam, Madam President. And now, let's see, as you as you heard, we have a really uh, high-level panel. So I'm looking forward now to the presentation that will set uh, or uh, contribute to, uh, along with the statements you just heard, to setting the scene for the subsequent uh, uh, debate. 
Uh, let me introduce the first of the panelists, who is the Honorable Heidi Fry. Uh, she's the OSCPA, as you heard, special representative on gender issues, uh, uh, the head of the Canadian delegation to the OSCPA. She's been acting these days, and we heard also uh, the speakers' conference. So we welcome very much your uh, presence, uh, uh, Heidi Fry, and, uh, and you have the floor, please. We, we are having some technical problems with the connection, so let's move to the second uh, panelist. Uh, hello. Oh, Can you hear me now? Hi. Okay, so back to you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say good morning, because uh, it's morning here in Vancouver, uh, Ambassador Zanier, and I wanted to thank you for bringing this issue forward, because I, I think it is absolutely key that we deal with, with this. As you know, section, uh, well, Resolution 1325 was brought up in 2000. Uh, that's a long time ago. And it was every member, the OSCE embraced it, the United Nations embraced it, of course, and everyone is supposed to set regional plans to be able, and, and national plans to be able to build into this. This has not really happened very well. I just wanted to point out a couple of quick things. In 2014, 85% of ambassadors involved in peace uh, keeping and in negotiations were male. Uh, that, uh, that, that was in 2014. It has changed very little. There has been a two percentage change in much of this. And I, and I wanted to place that on the table in perspective, mainly because the reason that women should be participating in the process is because women are the ones most affected. Women are the ones who actually suffer some uh, much of the trauma in conflict. And it's been shown that when women actually get involved for all, in all of the areas and all of the processes, that actually there's about a 35% chance of lasting um, negotiations and lasting peace processes. And so it's important for women to be there, not only for their own sakes and the, the sakes of their children, but actually women are particularly successful in this area. Um, the call, the call for action, actually, um, moves forward, but it's critical that we acknowledge that women must be equal participants in promoting sustain sustainable peace within the OSCE region. UNSCR 1325 and subsequent WPS um, uh, resolutions are based on a truth. With women's participation, peace efforts are more successful and more sustainable. There's another obvious truth, that it's been more than 20 years since this was adopted and women still are very underrepresented in peacekeeping and conflict resolution roles. For instance, in major uh, peace processes that occurred between um, 1992 and 2019, women accounted for 6% of mediators, 13% of negotiators, and 6% of signatories. In the United Nations peacekeeping organizations, the proportion of women in military, police, and security roles increased from 2015 to 2021 by literally 3%. So now we can proudly say that in security uh, and, and protection and in, in police, women are now 7.2% of the negotiators in the peace. This is not good enough. A survey in 2018 of women in the armed forces in the OSCE region found that women's representation in those forces in the OSCE averaged 10%, and that 55% of the OSCE participating states had strategies targeting women's participation. But those strategies are not followed up by budgets or financing. They're just there, they sound nice, but there is no actual real movement on any of this. Um, you know, 51% in, in, in the United Nations, 51% of the United Nations states had national action plans. 
but only 36% of those had a funding track. You cannot bring women into the process unless you fund, because we need to train women. We need to be able to get them to the front lines. And we know that there are not as many female ambassadors as there should be in the OSCE to participate and to be trained in this. And yet women are coming together. There are now regional alliances, such as the Mediterranean Women Negotiators Network. And now there's a global alliance of regional women mediators. I think women are coming together because they're training each other. They now have expertise. And the point is, without the talk that we have been talking, it is time for action. 20 years is a long time from talk to not seeing any kind of achievements. We need to get very clear action plans. And so what I wanted to suggest is, how can the OSVPA support women, peace and security agenda? In my view, Parliamentarians have three opportunities. The first one is many parliamentarians sit on parliamentary committees within their legislatures. And on those committees, the committees are mandated to look at international obligations that their country signed on to. Now, if we have more women on those committees, the women can look at the lack of actual movement on this issue and start bringing this forward to implement the WPS agenda. Now, Parliamentarians can and should be in, in, involved when they are on these committees, uh, not just leave it to governments. As parliamentarians, they have to be involved actually in the development, the monitoring, and, and, and the national action plans so that they are real and they're firm and they are able to move forward. Thirdly, a group of female parliamentarians, such as uh, a caucus of women parliamentarians in any particular country, should take the steps to move forward and bring this issue of women, peace and security and the lack of movement in this and the importance of women being there should bring this to the public, to the media and to civil society. It was civil society after all that began the movement to bring forward 1325. And so I think female parliamentarians have a real role to play. Now, let's, let's look into these opportunities for women parliamentarians. First, um, women parliamentarians can support the WPS agenda throughout the work of parliamentary committees, but so can male parliamentarians. Women should not be alone carrying the burden of implementing this particular issue. And so we need to get these parliamentary committees working on these issues. I don't know how many of the Foreign Affairs Committee. I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee in Canada, and yet we have we've looked at some of these and we have observed them. And Canada has moved forward quite a bit. For instance, we now have an ambassador, Canadian ambassador for women, peace and security. And she she is, in fact, pushing this agenda, and pushing this issue. But I think that women have to actually let the public and the media know most people are not aware of this initiative at all in our countries. This is a, a, a deeply kept secret by all of the executives uh, on governments. And so I think we need to move forward on giving women that opportunity to sit on these parliamentary committees. Secondly, you know, we need to start talking about more female um, foreign affairs ministers. You know, foreign affairs, female foreign affairs ministers might move forward on this issue a lot longer and a lot stronger than 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 male do. And I think it's I'm not uh, saying that men do not care about this issue. I'm looking at all of you on this panel here. You all care about the issue. I think the point is you have to make room for women to be engaged. We have to bring women at the table. We have to train them. We have to give them the funds and the money to be mentors and to move this agenda forward. So I think men have a huge role in moving the agenda forward for women, peace and security. And I think, for instance, I'll tell you what happened in Canada. Um, the Canadian Foreign Affairs Committee actually looked at this issue and we brought forward 17 recommendations, which caused the government of Canada to pay attention. Because once these recommendations are tabled in our parliament, the media sees it. Suddenly people get to see it because the public watch parliamentary proceedings all the time. And this came to the fore and the government had to act to implement some of the recommendations. So the question I'm asking is, 
are you what role are you playing in your parliamentary association or in your parliament to move this agenda forward and if you're not why not and now the second opportunity that we have to participate in the development of a national action plan that is an opportunity in which every parliamentarian should be asking for lobbying for making sure that their governments involve not just men but women at that table when they're developing their national action plans and how do we ask and clearly state openly that there needs to be an accountability process it's not good enough to have an action plan it needs to be supported with resources primarily money and and a lot of training needs it needs money so um, and, and parliamentarians have a considerable knowledge of how to bring about legislation to make things happen. Parliamentarians have a considerable amount of knowledge about how budgets can be adapted to move forward to make things happen. Uh, we launched our second national plan in 2017 here in Canada. According to the plan, the government of Canada has to table a report every year in Parliament on its progress with regard to women, peace and security. Now, that could be an issue that you might want to introduce into your parliament. And I think, um, you know, in 2021, Canada's foreign affairs minister announced the government's commitment to develop a third action plan, which is to build on the other two. And again, parliamentarians do play a very strong role and should play a strong role. So, so once again, I'm speaking to you as parliamentarians and not as an organization and a body because it's parliamentarians who are going to have to develop these, these at their national levels. And we've seen how badly this works. The third opportunity for parliamentarians to support the women, peace and security agenda is through raising awareness, as I said before, with the media and with the public. And so holding round tables, holding regional conferences, bringing the media there, getting this on an agenda, you will find that a lot of, of, of Canadians will support this because we know the important role that women can play, but we also know that women as, in, as victims in conflict need to be very involved in this if we are to move forward and maintain sustainable peace. So um, a women's caucus in any parliament in any country can hold these roundtables, bring them forward. Uh, also, you can talk with colleagues across parliament in different political parties it doesn't have to only be the government political parties have to come together and women have to move this agenda forward very clearly so in conclusion i want to celebrate the the women who are involved in peace and security currently small though they are they're mighty they're powerful and they're pushing and they are leaders that we need to help to mentor others to come forward and I think that we want to acknowledge again that as parliamentarians, each one of us individually and as groups have to move this agenda forward. As I said before, talk is not enough. For so many, many years, we talk about all the things we're going to do. And I know that in fact, within the OSCE, much of the movement in creating this has been blocked by Russia um, because they think the United Nations should be doing this. And that may or may not be so, but the OSC has a very special role to play. Given that we're talking about Helsinki 50, the OSC has to pull forward all of this agenda and say, we are, have an important and specific role to play in this region and that we should be moving forward and pushing forward to do it. So I'm pleading on you to let's get some action. I, I hope that we don't have to hold something like this in the next 10 years and and see that we've moved the, the needle up about two percentage again. Uh, this is not difficult. We have a lot of women who can play this role and female parliamentarians have to do so. But male parliamentarians, I am asking you to be supportive, to make sure that you speak to this, to make sure that you push this agenda forward. Because the whole idea of gender is for men and women to work together to make better solutions not simply for one group to be better than another together we have different perspectives together we have strength together we can make things happen so thank you very much uh, uh, ambassador zanier for allowing me to be here and to speak to this issue thanks to you honorable fly for this uh, powerful presentation of yours um, so let me uh, continue now with uh, His Excellency Ambassador Neil Bush, who is the head of the UK delegation to the OSCE, but is also the chair of the OSCE 
an engaged network, a network, by the way, which uh, was established at the time when I was the Secretary General, was very supportive of it. So I'll be interested also in hearing how the work is developing in that, uh, uh, in that context. Uh, Ambassador Bush, you have the floor, please. Um, thank you very much, um, Ambassador Zania, for the kind invitation to be on the, this panel. And also thank you to the Secretary General and to the Parliamentary Assembly President. Um, I've got two hats in this discussion, one from the government perspective of the WPS and the UN SCR 1325 perspective. Uh, and the second from chairing, as you said, uh, Lamberto, the USC Men Engaged Network which is aimed at ensuring that we can all play a crucial role in supporting gender equality and ensuring the full, equal and meaningful participation of women in peace processes. I've also come this morning straight from the IC's Forum for Security Cooperation, which was the opening session for Austria, which is, which is the chair, where I was struck by the sheer number of participating states who focused on the importance of this issue. So this is this is mainstreamed, and it's it, it's uh, it's an issue which comes up on a on a very regular basis, quite rightly, in the OSC and and uh, the forums there. A, a useful starting point is why is this important, and on that the the facts are clear. When women meaningfully participate in peace processes. The resulting agreement is 64% less likely to fail and 35% more likely to last at least 15 years. Um, quite powerful facts, though. Diversity, including diversity of leadership, leads to more informed decision making and better policies. And without women at the peace table, who obviously make up around half of the population, we're missing that valuable expertise and experience in shaping the future remembering that peace processes set that blueprint for that future. Women's participation in the informal spaces of peace processes must be recognized and valued, whilst also ensuring that the formal aspects of peace processes become enabling environments for women's meaningful, not just tokenistic participation, inclusion and representation. Um, in terms of examples, I wanted to start really outside the OSC area first and in Colombia, where women rallied public opinion for talks which led to the comprehensive peace agreement there in 2016 and were significantly represented as delegates in the inclusive peace talks. Their role there included mediating local ceasefires that led to passage of people, food and medicine, but also negotiating the release of hostages. During the Northern Ireland negotiations, female signatories representing the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition acted as channels for uh, by communal civil society involvement in the official peacemaking process and were able to broaden negotiations to include victims' rights as well as reconciliation. <clears throat> Women and girls can also ensure broader societal issues are included within peace and security mechanisms. And let's not forget that the obvious fact that women's rights are human rights. The OSC's Men Engaged Network, which I chair, recognizes that it's, it's in the interest of, of all of us, including men, to ensure that peace processes are more sustainable and to ensure that we account for all of these elements, enabling a comprehensive approach to security. Working in a leading security organization like the OSC, we, we recognize as a network that a number of steps are critical. And I wanted to list six which are critical to, to this network. First, to support and work towards an inclusive and positive working culture and environment, one which is free from any form of discrimination, bullying or harassment. Second, to challenge ourselves and to educate ourselves and that involves listening about obstacles and roadblocks for the WPS agenda. And that includes aspects such as bystander and ally training. Thirdly, to call out bad behavior when we see it, and that includes in um, peace processes and mechanisms around that. Fourthly, to recognize that men are often perpetrators of domestic violence, 
sexual violence and conflicts and sexual exploitation and abuse. And we've got a role and responsibility for stopping this. Uh, fifthly, for more men in senior positions and leadership positions to, to stand up, communicate and advocate for women's leadership. And finally, to get over any myths of the WPS agenda or gender equality, uh, more broadly being zero sum games. So therefore, as a, as a network, we deal with aspects and a mixture between listening, training ourselves and advocacy work. And that's that's what we what we're doing as a network. Now, putting on my hat as a representative of a participating state, there's a number of key initiatives I believe can enhance and support the WPS and the UNSCR 1325 agenda. Uh, some of these have already been mentioned. This includes the supporting of national action plans on WPS. And on this, it is encouraging to note that the number of these plans has grown since 2010. Uh, of the 57 OSC participating states, around two thirds now have a national action plan for implementing UNSCR 1325. But more needs to be done, and not only for those states who have yet adopted such a plan, but also for those who have uh, in ensuring adequate financing and funding for their implementation. And that was a point made by our uh, previous speaker. This was also reinforced at last year's OSC Ministerial Council in Toronto, where 52 participating states signed a joint statement on implementation of concrete actions in regard to the WPS agenda. And hopefully that number will be able to grow. We also need to recognize that women involved in peace processes often face risks and threats to their safety and security including through gender-based violence and abuse. So the protection framework for women peace builders that was developed by the International Civil Action Network, an organization called ICANN, contains guidance on how to provide much needed protection. This framework was developed uh, through conversations with women peace builders about their experiences and needs. And we in the UK government believe that supporting and following this guidance, we can help protect women peace builders to continue their work without threats or violence. Through their safe and active participation, we can help lay the groundwork for more sustainable peace. And more broadly, the IC's excellent toolkit on women and effective peace processes, which is was written by the, the, the Conflict Prevention Centre, and I know Ambassador Yoroda is, is going to speak shortly. That toolkit's got excellent recommendations and clear recommendations on ensuring a gender perspective and the full, equal and meaningful participation of women at all stages of peace processes. Um, and finally, I wanted to, to say something briefly about um, the role which we, which we think the parliamentarians play. Um, we think the parliamentarians play a crucial role in sharing best practice between countries providing scrutiny and oversight of national policies and, and action plans and budgets um, and raising awareness and providing thoughts, encouragement and ideas on how we can ensure the full, equal and meaningful participation of women in conflict prevention and resolution, peace negotiations, peace building, peacekeeping, humanitarian response and post-conflict reconciliation. And that includes in the area of UNSCR 1325 implementation. This is essential for the IOC's concept of comprehensive security. Um, I will stop there, um, but thank you very much once again for the invitation to be on the panel and, and all of your time and, and listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for your um, kind remarks. Uh, I think this has uh, uh, enriched and moved the, the uh, discussion, also focusing on uh, other aspects on how the OSC operates. So thank you for bringing these considerations in the debate. Now I would like to turn to uh, uh, Ambassador Tula Riola. Uh, she is the Deputy Head of the OSC Secretariat, and more specifically, uh, the director of the OSC Conflict Prevention Center, which, among other many other functions, also supervises the activity of all the OSC field operations. So she uh, uh, will open up another perspective of uh, OSC in action. So Tula, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. And 
Yes, indeed. Well, the previous speakers uh, provided some powerful examples, but also examples of why, why more should be uh, done. I would f start with saying that the topic of the uh, women, peace and security, I mean, it has long been high on the OSC agenda. And as we already heard uh, earlier, of course, this year under the Swedish chairpersonship, it's received additional uh, prominence. And I'm sure that you know that uh, the Secretary General Helga Schmidt is also very engaged in supporting the WPS agenda. Now, from the CPC point of view, uh, the WPS agenda aligns well with the OSC's comprehensive approach to security as well as to uh, our conflict cycle toolbox. And the, I would say that the cross-cutting nature of the WPS agenda really means that its implementation requires a holistic approach and uh, also action across the conflict cycle. So that ranges from conflict prevention to post-conflict re reconstruction. And, and um, well, there is the 2004 Gender Action Plan, which indeed tasked all OSC structures to promote the implementation of uh, UNSCR 1325. Uh, obviously, everyone according to their mandates, but uh, there are also numerous WPS references in OSC Ministerial Council decisions. So just to remind, I mean, there's actually at least eight, I think, ministerial level commitments that have been adopted since uh, 2000. That include a direct reference to one or more WPS resolutions. And these include uh, MC1405, uh, uh, but also MC311, uh, which uh, urge uh, both the OSC work uh, or the OSCE rather to work for women's participation in conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and post conflict rehabilitation. MC311 also urges participating states to implement UNSCR 1325 by ensuring increased uh, representation of women at all levels in conflict resolution and peace processes. So this uh, clearly gives the CPC a clear mandate to ensure that the OSC's conflict cycle toolbox is gender sensitive and inclusive. Uh, uh, and uh, just to remind also that this uh, MC311 is the decision that also strengthened overall our work related to all aspects of the conflict cycle. But indeed, it highlights the significant role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts and in peace building. Now, I wanted to provide you with some examples of our work, and then I will get to uh, the role of uh, the Parliamentary Assembly and Parliaments. Um, we provide targeted support to participating states in developing and implementing these uh, national action plans on WPS that we were uh, talking about already. And in that we offer advice and also conduct research as well as organize exchange of experiences and best practices. And, and, and let me add here that we're also importantly offering platforms for women peace builders and builders and civil society to contribute to and to influence the implementation of the WPS agenda. Ambassador Bush mentioned our toolkit on the inclusion of women and effective peace processes, and we're continuing to make use of that uh, to help the participating states and our partners implement the recommendations. And in fact, this year, um, we're hoping to provide targeted capacity building support to women negotiators uh, in Moldova in line with this toolkit. Later this year, we're going to be organizing a knowledge and experience exchange with high level track one women mediators and negotiators who've participated or, or are participating in the OSC led peace processes. Uh, we're also working to strengthen women's participation and leadership in the security sectors of the participating states. And we provide scholarship opportunities for young women professionals so that we're helping them further careers uh, in the field of security. And, and I do want to mention, in fact, this OSC scholarship for peace and security training program, which I think is excellent. It's, it's on, in order to address the scarcity of female experts in the fields of disarmament, arms control, non-proliferation. Uh, we really have a great program that trains young female professionals in these areas. And, and it's really been gratifying to observe how the young women among the alumni have subsequently pursued careers in the field of security. Uh, issues in addition also to becoming active in many other ways on these topics. And uh, well, we provide capacity building to participating states to uh, help prevent and address sexual and gender based violence in conflict situations, as well as to strengthen women's rights through legislation, policies and programs. Again, I think something extremely important. Now, we've seen uh, that voices of the conflict affected are not reflected well in track one processes. So 
in the Geneva international discussions, uh, which, uh, as you know, deal with the consequences of the uh, 2008 armed conflict in Georgia, the OEC, together with the EU and, and UN co-chairs, um, have embarked on a process that's aiming to strengthen the women uh, peace and security agenda. Uh, so what the uh, GID co-chairs try to do is to create more ownership among all participants on the topic and to tackle the gap between conflict affected people and in this in particular women and the track one process in uh, Geneva. The CPC is playing an active role in this and I'm really glad to report that there is increased consideration by the participants of, of how men and women are differently affected by conflict. And as we well know, um, well, it is best to prevent conflicts from breaking out in the first place. And, and again, we're involving women in, in such efforts. And this is where our field operations, um, programmatic approaches uh, come into play. They're gender sensitive uh, when they are addressing the root causes of conflict and instability. Um, there's always a lot of talk about early warning, and we have an early warning, OSC-wide early warning focal point uh, that the CPC is coordinating. There are members uh, from the field operations, the three autonomous institutions, also the parliamentary assembly, as well as the secretariat. And here again, I think it's very important that about half of these uh, early warning focal points are women. It does give uh, this uh, balanced perspective. And on a more general level, uh, finally, to just say that um, or finally, before I get to the PA um, and my comments on that, uh, to say that, of course, we are at the OSC aiming to lead by example. So, you know, mainstreaming a gender perspective in all our activities and really working to also ensure gender parity across the entire organization. And, and I think it's great that we've gone from 28% women in senior management overall in 2018 to 40% today. I suppose I am one of those uh, who has contributed to that, um, being a woman and having come to the job um, after that 2018. Um, when it comes to gender balance in our field operations, as of this August, 60% men, 40% women in total, I think one continuing challenge is the low representation of women among the monitoring officers at the SMM, the Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine, um, working to encourage participating states uh, for advocating more female nominations, but this is a challenge. Anyway, so despite all the progress that's been made over the past 20 years to implement the WPS agenda, I mean, we know it's it's far from ideal. So, um, I mean, few women still serve as mediators in OSC-led negotiation processes and, and women civil society actors are really not yet or have not gained access to and influence in such processes. Um, there was already talk about really more to be done to implement the national action plans, uh, including allocating sufficient funding to them. And we need to do more. And this is really, I think, where the Parliamentary Assembly and the Parliament in the OSC region can play an important role. So just to make my own pitch, um, I mean, national parliaments and individual parliamentarians uh, have a vital role to play. And, and this really is in strengthening coordination, but also the funding, as I mentioned, and oversight. I mean, it is possible to set up all party parliamentary committees on WPS to support harmonization with other relevant plans and policies. Uh, it's possible to create dedicated bodies to scrutinize the implementation of the WPS agenda and, and also really to work to secure sufficient and earmarked funding for the na national action plans. And I think that uh, parliamentarians can really help to mobilize action and to foster more inclusive processes simply already by connecting with women in the communities that you serve and, and bringing political attention to their needs and priorities. And you and your fellow parliamentarians and parliaments can create forums for systematic engagement between women's civil society actors, parliaments and government. For example, when it comes to uh, localizing the WPS agenda and um, integrating WPS issues in, in relevant national policies and frameworks, conducting gender responsive budgeting and, and working to achieve equal participation in parliament will also help towards creating a pool of women with well-advanced political careers who can be considered for leading positions in conflict resolution later on. So I think that the, the PA can really use um, your unique position to support 
the implementation of WPS in the OSC by, by integrating this agenda into your daily work. Uh, raising these issues in committees and in decisions, appointing women as special representatives. Um, and, and of course, I'm glad to see that all these many of these efforts are already ongoing. I mean, including when it comes to gender balance among the uh, special representatives and, and also integrating gender dimensions into statements and, and PA can organize knowledge and experience exchanges. Uh, uh, I mean, you've got a valuable forum for dialogue. The Helsinki 50 uh, plus 50 process is an excellent platform to increase attention to the WPS agenda. Uh, including, of course, by prioritizing it as a key thematic issue to focus on during the 50th anniversary of the Helsinki Final Act, as, as in fact you are doing with today's event. So, so this is really what I had to say. Uh, sorry for taking a long. Um, I would have loved to tell you a little story from Tajikistan, where I was head of mission before. I will leave that so that I don't take too much time. But thank you so much for uh, for giving me the opportunity to participate in this. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your kind remarks, for your very rich uh, presentation, and also for, like uh, uh, Ambassador Bush did, for pointing the areas where parliamentarians can, uh, in fact, uh, make a difference and give uh, a substantive contribution. But there was another point I also wanted to make, is that I have uh, uh, a person here who is a researcher who is assisting me in the overall uh, uh, Helsinki plus uh, uh, 50 uh, process. And she's a young uh, uh, Kazakh lady researcher, and she in fact benefited from the scholarship you mentioned earlier on uh, peace for peace and security. She went through that and she uh, believes that that scholarship was instrumental in helping her uh, um, getting this position of uh, assistant researcher now here in the, the Secretariat of the Parliamentary Assembly. So one, one of the issues, and an issue that she pointed out to me uh, uh, herself, is that it should be, once we invest in very, these very useful initiatives, we should also make sure uh, that we follow them up and we ensure inclusion of the alumni in our, uh, in our activities, so that there is a coherence in a way uh, between the investment that we make and also how we use the resources that we have, uh, uh, that we have prepared. But, but thank you very much. This was uh, uh, also another inspiring uh, presentation, and I hope that this will also encourage the discussion afterwards. I would like to encourage everybody to uh, uh, also interact uh, with the panelists in the, in the debate. And now uh, to the last uh, panelist, uh, the Honorable uh, uh, Kari Eriksen from Norway. Uh, Kari has been, in fact, one of the promoters of the idea of the focus on uh, women, peace, and security, and gender issues more broadly in the context of the Helsinki uh, Plus uh, 50 uh, process. So I was uh, glad that she was available, available to join us uh, in this panel discussion. In the meantime, she's also been appointed as uh, uh, OSCPA Special Representative on South Caucasus, so she will have also an opportunity to focus on uh, geographic, uh, uh, specific geographic issues uh, in, uh, in her future work. But Kari, I'm very glad you could uh, join us today and you have the floor, please. Thank you, dear Ambassador. And uh, <clears throat> I'm honored to be a part of this panel, and I look forward to the discussion on the parliamentarian's contribution to women, peace and security. And as you mentioned, I was recently appointed as a special representative, and I look forward to taking the gender perspective with me in that position also. At the outset, let me underline that the pandemic has detrimental effect on gender equality and women's rights. I underline this in my report to the OSCE PA third committee in July. And so to the role of parliamentarians, what are the role they can have? I strongly believe that as members of national parliaments, as elected representatives of the people and society, we should promote peace, security, and gender equality in all our polity work. Yet the responsibility for this lies with every person in power, no matter where they are, uh, whether they are elected, designated, or employed. Presidents, Prime Ministers, Secretary Generals, Ambassadors and MPs all share the same responsibility. And in my view, the time has come for us as MPs to consider the concrete consequences of our legislation, the policymaking and oversight functions on gender equality. 
in Norway, we have rules that we should uh, that every policy um, um, department shall report on gender issues to the parliament. And I think that's a very good idea to raise the awareness of gender equality in the in the um, uh, in the government and in the the where the people are working and giving services to the people. And what, for instance, are the consequences of the of our economic policies on gender equality? Do we know it or do we assume something? What are the consequences of labor market policies? And education politics? I don't think uh, there is uh, too much uh, consideration amongst the consequences of the policy making we are doing in the parliaments. And we have to ensure that the resources and the support of the changes we want to make is enough to drive the change, to make the changes be a reality. And we must remember that the systematic engagement between civil society, governments, parliaments and international organizations and experts must remain vital. When it comes to women, peace and security, I think the critical role of women in achieving peace and development has been recognized in a series of UN resolutions on women, peace and security, and has been reaffirmed in both the sustaining peace agenda and the sustainable development goals. Women play a vital role in peace and reconciliation. Three Nobel Peace Prizes in the last decade shows this clearly. The most recent example of this is the award to Nadia Murad in 2018. She got the prize together with Dennis Mukwege for her efforts to end sexual violence as a weapon of war and armed conflict. Malala Yousafzai from Afghanistan, with her focus on girls' education in 2014, is another important prize. The 2011 prize to Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Leima Gboe and Takawul Karman put the focus on the struggle for the safety of women and the right to take part in peace building work. Gender equality has to be on the agenda on international organizations. Many women have shown leadership. Personally, I am inspired by the former Norwegian Prime Minister, Gro Harlem Brundtland, who played a key role in the Beijing Conference in 1995 and later headed the WHO. Michel Bachelet, in the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, has also made important contributions. And I think we who work in either parliaments or in international organizations, we have to much more often name the women who have made contributions. Because in the public debates and in media, women are often shadows and they are often forgotten as persons. So we have to remember them and name them. And we need to broaden their basic understanding of gender equality. I'm convinced that the we as MPs can contribute significantly to closing the gap between the ambition of international commitments and laws in place and the actual application and political will to do so. I'd like to commend Secretary General Helga Smead, as several of you have also have been doing, for putting women, peace and security on the agenda on the OSCE. And also the Swedish chairpersonship is very encouraging in this theme. Let me also commend the OSCE for its websites, Women on the Contact Line. This series presents stories of people in the ground and in their neighborhoods. It's important for us to learn about how the security situations affect the daily lives of women. Finally, Gender party, par, parity is not itself sufficient for achieving gender equality. Equality goes beyond mere numbers. It matters how we think about gender. Hundreds of years of tradition 
needs to be rewritten. We need more women in leadership positions. Leaders and we as MPs must take our responsibility in promoting qualified women candidates. We must ensure that everyone understands that gender mainstreaming contributes to achieving the mission and the larger object objectives of the OSCE and the OSCE PA. I was asked to say something about the Norwegian experience. And as you may know, we have a female prime minister and we also have a female uh, foreign minister. As a female politician in Norway, I do my best to put gender equality on the agenda. And luckily, I have many male members with me in that work. We worked hard to promote gender equality. Yet, this is an ongoing process. There is still much to do. In Norway, men still earn more, men still earn more than women. Men still control the financial sector. Men still beat their wives. At the same time, we have Gender Equality Act, which serves us well. My point is that we still need to work on these issues and look ahead. Laws and commitments are not enough. They have to be followed up how they function out in the practical field. The percentage of women in the Norwegian parliament is presently 42%. After our parliamentary elections next week, the 13th of September, I hope this number will rise. Abuse, bullying and sexual harassment in the workplace and in social media means that, mean that many people, especially young women, hesitate to go into politics. Harassment in social media has been an issue in our ongoing election campaign. We need to make sure that political parties, in cooperation with national authorities, help to contract this. As MPs, we have to be positive role models. And also the police and the authorities need to address this harassment. The president of the Storting recently underlined that the parliament has zero tolerance towards bullying and sexual harassment. This is included in the new ethical guidelines to MPs. The situation will be monitored in surveys in our parliament every second year. And in my view, it will be important to follow this closely. Our parliamentarians, our parliament must take a leading role and illustrate that politics is a place where respect for each other is in the forefront. An ODA guide to gender sensitive parliaments will soon be released. One of the findings in a case study on Norway is that national legislation is a key driver for gender equality. I hope this guide will be useful for many of you. At present, the Norwegian government is implementing the fourth, fourth action plan on women, peace and security. The Norwegian armed forces have, have universal conscription and the overall number of women is 19%. Survey shows, however, that harassment and sexual violence still occurs. We must follow this closely. In sum, I believe that we are not where we want to be on gender equality or on women, peace and security yet. We must continue our work in the time ahead and collaborate to achieve more gender equality in all areas of life. And I look very much forward to hear some specific proposals about how we can move forward in the OSCE PA and what you think about the proposals the panelists have addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Hedrickson, for uh, your presentation, your suggestions. And I would like also to underline your very final point, uh, which is to encourage everybody to uh, uh, a comment on the um, uh, large number of this point of comments and proposals that have been put forward uh, by the initial speakers and by, and by the panelists. Uh, so now I have uh, six requests on the floor. You see them in the, uh, in the chat. I would like to encourage others who may be interested to uh, uh, just signal their uh, uh, interest to uh, um, uh, participate in the debate. There is no need for long statements. Uh, I would like to make it as interactive 
as possible, and the panelists, of course, are there also to uh, uh, reply or comment on, uh, on your own comments and on your own uh, uh, requests uh, for additional information. Uh, so the first of the speakers is Vice President Irene Carlambides from Cyprus. Irene, you have the floor. Thank you. Let me congratulate first the organizers and, of course, the panelists for their important contribution to this uh, discussion. Coming from Cyprus, a country still suffering the severe consequences of military invasion and ongoing incubation, I fully acknowledge the impact that armed conflict has on women and girls and how urgent this priority is. Many Cypriot women fleeing their towns and villages in flames as the Turkish troops advanced suffered rape, torture, and extreme humiliation, most times in the presence of their beloved ones, before many of them were brutally murdered. Sexual violence as a weapon of war was indeed used in my country in 1974. However, it was the Cypriot women that took on a significant part of the weight to restore the social fabric and the economy of our country in the decades that followed. Furthermore, women have always been at the forefront on the, of the reunification process in Cyprus. It is important to note that after the end of hostilities, Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot women's groups were the first to start by communal meetings aimed at contributing to the efforts to restore peace, reconciliation and reunification. They created forums to discuss joint actions and address practical issues. These initiatives have paved the way to wider civil society involvement that actively supports and contributes to bringing the Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot communities closer together. While in essence, women's contribution was quite significant, yet their visibility remained low. Regarding the implementation of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, Cyprus adopted last year its first five-year national action plan. Its main purpose is to recognize the disproportionate impact of war on women and girls, to highlight the role of women in conflict prevention and conflict resolution and to build peace. As the chairwoman of the Committee of Human Rights and Equal Opportunities between men and women in the Cyprus Parliament, I am committed to monitoring the implementation of the National Action Plan so that it can be our compass towards peace, security and the participation of more women in reunification efforts. Obviously, Implementing Security Council Resolution 1325 cannot be dissociated from border efforts to achieve gender equality. The effective participation of women in peace processes must constitute an integral part of a dynamic process for gender mainstreaming with the aim of overcoming persisting challenges such as the pension and wage gap the unequal representation in decision-making posts and all other forms of discrimination. At the same time, the OSCPA must also make a greater con contribution to the implementation of UN Resolution 1325 through further enhancing representation of women parliamentarians amongst the assembly's officials and in its own conflict prevention and mediation work, especially election observation or other missions. The OSCPA special representative, Mrs. Fry's input has been very significant in this respect. Dear colleagues, 21 years after the adoption of UN Resolution 1325, we are still facing many challenges regarding its implementation. The COVID-19 pandemic is having and this proportionate impact on women and has created an additional hurdle on the path to gender equality. Additionally, conflict-related violence 
continues to affect women despite our commitment to prevent it. What is occurring in Afghanistan following the Taliban's return to power is very alarming. We must act promptly and collectively for the protection of human rights, especially of women and girls in this country. As parliamentarians, we must intensify our efforts to eliminate discrimination and inequalities against women across the board, which will substantially contribute to efforts towards the implementation of Resolution 1325 and towards a more peaceful and prosperous future for all. And I have to make a remark. OSCPA has a woman as, pres as president. So let's hope that for many years to come, women will be president of OSCPA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Carambides, for your, uh, for your presentation. You know, all of your points, including the last one, have been noted. Uh, let me now move on to the next uh, uh, speaker, uh, Congressman uh, uh, Steve Cohen from the United States. Representative uh, Cohen, you have the floor. Uh, there seems to be a problem with the connection, uh, so let's uh, uh, let's move to the uh, next speaker, with, who is the vice president. Uh, Hello. Uh, oh yes, yes, yes. We we can hear uh, Congressman Cohen. You have the floor, sir. You missed some great great words, but I missed the unmute button. But I found it, so I'm back. Thank you. I, it's just an honor to be with you today, and I appreciate your taking up this topic. There is no subject that the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly or any institution of government representatives could take up that would affect more people than women. They are the majority population on this planet, and they have been su subjected to second-class citizenship by men from time immemorial. Starting with Adam, it's come a long way. America's done better, and we're going to do better. President Biden has implemented an executive policy uh, to look into improving women's rights and equities in our country, and that's most important. The previous administration had a dearth of women in the cabinet and in positions of power. President Biden has a cabinet and a government that reflects women's importance and their numbers with many, many women cabinet members. We've seen, as the previous speaker uh, commented, the horrors in Afghanistan, the threat to women and girls there, which is an extreme, but it's in a situation that exists in many parts of the world where women and girls do not have the opportunities to participate and fulfill their, their dreams, their aspirations, and their capabilities as not only members of parliaments and presidents of OSCEs, but scientists and doctors and executives and bank officials, et cetera. So we're doing better. The United States is doing better. I'm honored to be a part of this group and have been for many years. I'm the co-chair of the Helsinki Commission, and I will be the chair of the upcoming United States delegation to the OCE Parliamentary Assembly. I promise you that our delegation will participate strongly and work for the opportunities for women to participate in peace and security. I am a child of Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi may be the greatest political leader in our country's parliamentary history, certainly the leading woman. She's been the speaker, and my first vote I cast as a member of Congress was for Nancy Pelosi for speaker. She, they say that in politics and certain positions of political leadership, particularly parliamentary assemblies, it's like herding cats. Nancy Pelosi knows how to herd cats because she knew, knew how to hurt her family or be happy and keep them together. And she keeps our caucus together. Learning from Nancy Pelosi, I think that the world would be better off if women were in charge of all the pieces. 
processes in the world, and the world would be a better place. I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I look forward to listening to your remarks. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much for your remarks, uh, Congressman Cohen. Um, let me uh, continue the list now with uh, Vice President Ashka Shakiro from Kazakhstan. Vice President Shakiro, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Good afternoon, dear Madam President, dear colleagues. Achieving gender equality and improving women and girls is goal number five of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Therefore, as a special representative of the Assembly on the UN SDGs, I consider today's event to be very important. Ensuring social, economic, and physical protection of women, respect for rights and uh, freedoms, elimination of violence uh, and form all forms of discrimination as well as the advancement of women in power structures are among the most important priorities in the development of the OEC member states. Kazakhstan has reached the UN Millennium Development Goals ahead of schedule in terms of ensuring gender equality. Our country is a member of the UN Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. We have ratified the optional protocol to the convention. Kazakhstan is one of the countries with a very high level of gender development, uh, leading among the CIS countries in the de uh, gender development index. President Tokayev attached great, great importance to gender-oriented strategy in his reform agenda. It is <coughs> evidenced by the introduction of a 30% quota for women and youth of the list of candidates for political parties. This political innovation resulted in an increase of women's representation in the lower house of parliament to 27% for the first time in the history of Kazakhstan's parliamentary system. Women occupy leading positions in business. According to the latest statistics, women lead 43% of small and medium-sized enterprises. Women entrepreneurs provide approximately one third of all workplaces in the sector. Kazakhstani women participate in uh, peacekeeping operations to restore peaceful life in post-conflict countries. Dear colleagues, I believe that the participation of women is essential to ensure an effective and sustainable peace. The experience of successful countries shows that one of the factors of their progress in an active use the potential of women in social economic development of the country, as well as the availability of equal opportunities to fulfill intellectual and labor potential of women. I am convinced that we parliamentarians should encourage the political leadership to achieve greater balance in representation of women, create an enabling environment and capacity building so that women can realize their full potential. Thank you for attention. Uh, thank you, Vice President Shakiro. As I mentioned earlier, I have a really brilliant uh, Kazakh lady researcher assisting me in this uh, in this process. So that's uh, uh, also a sign of uh, uh, how Kazakh women can play a strong role in international institutions. Um, let's uh, uh, move on. Uh, the next uh, uh, speaker I have in the list is uh, is this Obir now? I don't see the yes. See the is Graciela Pavone from the Office of uh, uh, Democratic Institutional Human Rights in Warsaw. Thank you very much, Ambassador Zanier. Oh, dear welcomes this event uh, and dear CPA's engagement in promoting Parliament's role in the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, also in direct connection with the call for action for Helsinki Plus 50. Because of its mandate, to support democratic institutions and human rights, ODEA also works to make Parliament stronger advocates of gender equality and key allies in the WPS implementation. Engaging Parliament is a necessity, underscoring the interrelation between democracy, gender equality, and peace and security. 
The participation of women in all matters related to conflict prevention and security is an essential feature of democratic societies without which no society can develop and thrive. As it has been stressed, uh, parliaments in the OEC region should make use of their rich palette to oversee the implementation of 1325 action plans, but they should also be instrumental in ensuring that WPS action by the executive uh, is adequately resourced through their budget approval powers. As such, parliaments can be instrumental in keeping the focus on WPS high on the government's agenda, whether in peace or in situations of conflict. In addition, as part of their contribution to lawmaking, they can address and remove obstacles ingrained in legal frameworks that impair women's participation in peace and security issues, such as, for example, laws restricting the inclusion of women in particular professional categories in the security and defense sector. Parliaments also benefit from the oversight of independent bodies, such as NHRIs, as well as special monitoring bodies, such as Ombuds Institutions for the Armed Forces, but also from the cooperation with civil society organizations, which are watchdogs uh, over the action of the executive. ODEA actively supports this work through the promotion of the Gender and Security Toolkit and related capacity building for different stakeholders, including parliaments. ODEA also supports parliaments in conducting gender audits and developing gender action plans, aiming at making them gender sensitive institutions, among others, to better perform their oversight role related to international standards. To conclude, parliaments also bear a responsibility, parliamentarians as elected representatives, to remain tuned with the security perception of the entire population and also translate these needs into political action. In times of crisis, this effectively means playing a role in diffusing hostile rhetoric that can fuel conflict, and by doing so, acting as peace builders with their constituencies. Thank you. Thank you very much. This demonstrates once again the richness and the broad spectrum of uh, activities uh, uh, that are carried out by the various uh, sides of the OSC, a very, a very complex set of uh, uh, of institutions and operations. Um, next uh, uh, speaker on my list is uh, uh, Senator Marilou uh, McFedron from Canada. Madam Senator, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, yes, we can hear you perfectly well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am going to speak specifically on the situation in, Af in Afghanistan. And this is a plea to parliamentarians in countries that have agreed to be third countries in the process of, of evacuees who we have managed to get out of Afghanistan and now are being held in a variety of ways in third countries. And we need cooperation. Any parliamentarians, for example, Uzbekistan, um, uh, Ukraine, Turkey, we, we know, for example, I'm working with young athletes, um, snowboarders, runners, women soccer players. We've managed to get a number of them out. Canada is very happy to welcome them, but um, many of them are stuck in these third countries. And we're working with embassies, we're working with civil society organizations, and I'm speaking directly to you as my colleague parliamentarians. If any of you are involved or wish to become involved in facilitating the movement of Afghan evacuees, especially women parliamentarians, of whom there are a number that are still trapped in Afghanistan, I would love to hear from you. Um, parliamentarians can add a great deal to this process. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thanks to you for your intervention. May, may I remind everybody that Afghanistan, while not being a member of the OSCE, it's a partner country of the OSCE. And of course, the situation in Afghanistan has uh, repercussions uh, uh, in the region, and so in the OSCE part of the region and beyond. 
so I think this uh, also this uh, call for action in a way is uh, is very relevant also for the parliamentary assembly. So thank you, thank you very much for your intervention, Madam Senator. Uh, uh, next speaker is uh, um, is uh, the Honourable uh, Maka Bocorizvili from Georgia. Senator, um, uh, the Honourable Bocorizvili, on the floor, please. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Dear Lamberto, dear Roberto, I thank the Secretariat for putting this issue of women, peace and security at the top of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly agenda and convening this meeting uh, today. And again, amid COVID-19 pandemics, we are meeting today against the backdrop of increased and complex challenges to the rules-based international order. Whereas women are within the most vulnerable groups under these circumstances. For Georgia, where 20% of its territories is still occupied by Russia, where more than 53% of officially registered based persons are women, UN Security Council Resolution 3025 and its related resolutions on women, peace, and security are very important. Georgia is the first country in the region which adopted national action plan 10 years ago, which is consequently dated. It constitutes a whole of government approach to integrating gender perspective in the security sector and in decision making processes using a gender lens in peace negotiations, protecting the rights of women and girls and promoting their meaningful participation in conflict prevention and resolution. Full and equal participation of women in peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peacebuilding processes with the view of ensuring long lasting and sustainable peace is crucially important, especially for Georgia, which still faces Russia's military presence here. Continued closure of the crossing point on the occupation line and impediment for the urgent medical evacuations, limited access to health care are some of those challenges that women and girls in occupied regions are facing together with other difficulties stemming from the occupation. Enhanced international cooperation and firm international support is essential to counter the challenges we face today. Georgia has a rich history of women, women playing in important role in countries that increased number of women parliamentarians will contribute to better um, decision making and better governance. Getting more women into politics gives a voice to women and girls around the world to enable them to fight for their rights, creates female role models and leads to legislation to work which tackles gender inequalities and discrimination. In conclusion, Georgia is committed to further contribute and uh, continue its implementation of 3025 uh, resolution and to promote women's meaningful participation in peacemaking, peacekeeping processes and enhance their role in conflict resolution and peacebuilding efforts. I thank you again for organizing this discussion today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, Maka, for your uh, contribution, and it was good to see you again. Um, when when I, uh, I was uh, listening to you, I also remembered uh, when I served as uh, High Commission National Minorities, and uh, Christoph Kamp might later uh, also also mention that uh, we had, among others, an interesting project in Georgia uh, to bring young men and women from minorities communities uh, uh, into the. In, a main, in the main uh, stream political parties by giving them internships with, uh, with the political parties and trying to uh, encourage inclusion of, uh, of men and women from minority communities uh, in, uh, in national politics reflecting their own thing. And that's uh, a, a good also conflict prevention uh, tool, not, not that this means that there would be conflict otherwise, but it, it stabilizes societies. So, Conflict prevention is always something that needs to take a very long, uh, uh, um, how can I say, strategic approach. 
And, uh, and within that, it is essential to have also this balance and to have a stronger uh, gender perspective to ensure that every part of the society is included in, this, uh, in these activities. So thank you again, and it was good hearing from you. And uh, let's thank you, thank you, Lambert. Yeah, thank you. And then let's continue with our uh, discussions now. I have uh, the Honorable uh, Yusuf Bashir from uh, Turkey. Yep, yep, yep. Distinguished guests, first of all, thank you very much for your wonderful explanations on the topic. I would like to extend my kindest remarks to all of you. You know, for the implementation of uh, this resolution, it's very important for the participation of the women, and it is a key instrument. However, in despite the 20 years that we have witnessed, this issue has not fully been implemented. I'm really sorry about this. Before I start with my remarks, I would like to correct one minor issue. You know, there are two nations in Cyprus and there are two democracies and two states in Cyprus. I would like to state this and underline this over and over. And I would like the Greek Cypriot administration of Southern Cyprus to recognize this and to acknowledge this. Actually, the issue, at the very basics of the Cyprus issue, there lies the intention of the Greek Cypriot administration seeing themselves as the sole owner of the island and unwillingness to share the well Fair and the ruling of the island together with their Turkish counterparts. And it is the mentality of the Greek Cypriots that has paved the way for a failure in the negotiations since 1968, especially before, I mean, after the 1974, the peace uh, operation. The, the, it is the Turkish uh, parties that were sent away and displaced from their homes and women and young women were were raped by the militants of the relevant Greek terrorist organizations. They were raped in front of their mothers and no no one can claim the opposite. And it's not possible for us to accept this ever. And because in our belief, in our religious belief, we can never accept the rape of any individual, but on the contrary, even we do not let anyone's nose bleed. I mean, this is our belief. This lies at the very core of our beliefs. And you have to recognize this. This has never been the case for us. And at this very point that we have come, we can say that we can claim that if there has not we do not have an additional 50 years to continue with the negotiations. This is a luxury for both of the communities. And it is the Greek Cypriots that have the, that have rejected the peace negotiations back in 2017. It is the mentality of the Greek Cypriots that have avoided in Transmontana meeting any uh, peace resolution. We do not wish to lose another 50 years as two communities of the islands. If there are going to be... Uh, Conflict resolution, it should be carried out not between the two communities, but also but between two states. Distinguished guests, not only the access of the women in military or processes, but their participation actively in the intermediary processes is very important. We always support the advancement of women in that sense. Turkey will continue to realize its commitment in that sense and attaches utmost importance to the realization of this perspective. And by Austria, Kazakhstan, Turkey and Finland, in term, uh, this is jointly supported by those countries. And we do hope that this is going to be, uh, this plan is going to be adopted by all the countries because we do believe that this plan will definitely positively contribute to the implementation of the existing objectives. It is important to share the common practices, the best practices, and the code of conduct, we also attach utmost importance to the implementation of the code of conduct, as well as the implementation of the uh, resolution 1325. As the 50 countries in o OSCEPA, we are now celebrating this 20th anniversary of this resolution. And there are female officers, non-commissioned officers, military personnel, female military personnel in the Turkish army. They are vested with different duties in different organizations. Their trainings, their experience is unique and their capacity is constantly enhanced. 
and we are uh, appointing them to the most convenient uh, cadres without making any discriminations when compared to their male colleagues. This is the case in Turkish army. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, just one plea from my side. This is not uh, a, a, a debate about uh, conflict resolution, otherwise we'll have a different agenda. So I would like to ask you to abstain from uh, uh, commenting on specific, uh, uh, on specific regional issues and focus on the broader uh, question of uh, uh, the role of uh, women in uh, promoting uh, peace and security. Uh, and uh, there will be opportunities in the future of this uh, Helsinki plus 50 process also uh, to discuss more specifically how can we improve the uh, uh, role of the OSC in addressing uh, um, uh, controversial situations and conflicts. Um, next uh, uh, speaker on the list uh, is uh, uh, Mr. Christoph Kamp, who is the director of the office uh, of the High Commission of National Minorities in The Hague, uh, uh, a function that I myself uh, uh, had before uh, joining uh, as, as a manager of this process, uh, the uh, Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, Christoph, uh, yeah. you have the floor. Thank you very much. Can I first check if you can hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you very well. You can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It's, it's really wonderful to see you and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, um, to say a few words from the perspective of the Office of the High Commissioner on National Minorities and, and thank you very much to already referring to our work and I will indeed address an example or two um, in, the, in the comments I would like to make. Of course, the Office of the High Commissioner has a conflict prevention mandate and not only short-term conflict prevention but works very much also on issues related to longer term societal integration and in in the course of this discussion i would like to make a few comments on the role of women um, in the areas where successful societal integration can help prevent conflict from the perspective of this office broad inclusive participation contributes to creating and maintaining stable just and peaceful societies and a meaningful level of representation and participation of all social groups in all fields of public life is vital to foster loyalty to trust in the institutions of the state. And this helps to ensure ownership of decision-making processes by all members of societies, which in turn positively affects social cohesion. Now the High Commissioner on National Minorities promotes integrated and inclusive societies by developing and offering policy advice in a number of sectorial fields. And I would like in this regard to highlight the so-called Ljubljana guidelines on integration of diverse societies and the Lund recommendations on the effective participation of national minorities in public life, published by the Office of the High Commissioner, as especially relevant for the discussion of today. I also would like to make the comment that the terms inclusion and participation from the perspective also from this office is not restricted to ethnicity. It has a far wider reach than that. And in many parts of the world, women continue to face multiple barriers to full and meaningful participation in public life. And while women lag behind in most spheres of public life, in the case of minority women, gender issue intersects with other issues, such as ethnicity and language, often exposing women to multiple cross-cutting forms of discrimination. Now, a lack of gender disaggregated data combined with a shortcoming of ethnicity-based data is a challenge in analyzing. Uh, for our office, but also for, um, uh, for other partners uh, to analyze the barriers that minority women face. And the Office of the High Commission on National Minorities has therefore started to embark on a comprehensive research on this topic. And we hope this will inform policies in this field. And we hope to be able to share the key findings with you once the research is complete by mid 2022. But a few observations uh, already at this stage on the root causes for marginalization and discrimination of women and some possible solutions. First is the cultural factor, which may play a significant role in gender imbalance. More often than not, minority women are first excluded and discriminated against in their own communities as well. Another barrier to women's full participation and empowerment is language. And minority women may have fewer opportunities to acquire proficiency in the state language. Without that, they may encounter difficulties securing a job, 
applying for public posts or registering as candidates in local and national elections. What we have done in, in some participating states of the OSCE is develop a project based on multilingual education. And what we have seen um, in, in some of the participating states based on, on, on research is that with these programs, the number of girls which finished high school is higher than on girls which were not exposed to learning the state language, but who stayed in schools of minority language of instruction. By a higher degree of um, uh, finalizing high school, they of course improve their situation on the labor market. Um, so the approach of our office is to, when it comes to language, is to ensure that minority communities are equipped to have the same access and to the same opportunities in societies that members of the majorities can benefit from while protecting their respective mother tongues. More generally, maintaining the delicate balance between protection of minority identities and their integration into a larger society is the key to building successful inclusive policies. Sometimes measures and arrangements to promote participation, including minorities in public fora, are indeed in place, but do not actively encourage participation and representation of women. And this is why we indeed have a few projects. Um, Ambassador Sanjay referred to the project in Georgia, where we work with political parties to include young people, um, but in particular also young women, to participate in an internship project. And we are trying now to replicate this program to other participating states as well. When it comes to um, minority participation um, and that it should not come at the expense of, of women's participation, and we think that in, in our experience, the work of parliaments here is crucial. So when designing policies and legislation that affect minorities, there is a need for an active effort to identify and address the specific needs of minority women. And we try from our office to apply this in our work as well, to systematically mainstream gender in the High Commissioner's policy recommendations in order to address outstanding um, gaps in this field. And let me perhaps say a few words on the, on the present situation post-COVID. When um, Ambassador Zanye was the High Commissioner on National Minorities, he published um, recommendations on streamlining diversity, COVID-19 measures that support social cohesion, um, and subsequent interactions with participating states from our office have regularly advocated that measures to alleviate the impact of the crisis. And I can give a number of examples. There's a high reliance on female labor force for informal sectors, such as paid domestic work and agriculture, combined with increased childcare related responsibilities has led to higher rates of female unemployment compared to the situation in previous economic recessions. And we see that in particularly true for minority women. Um, so our office has dedicated attention to that and um, I'm happy to ask uh, to respond to any further questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Christoph. And uh, um, you have, uh, how can I say, added quite a few uh, uh, important elements to, to the discussion. Uh, it's, uh, it's already been a very rich debate. So I would like to uh, go back to the panelists uh, uh, to ask them. We, we have so many uh, pieces of information, ideas, proposals on the on the table, and see whether you have any views uh, as to what uh, should should be maybe the uh, key areas of attention for the parliamentary assembly uh, as we proceed and as we move towards uh, uh, towards uh, uh, 2025 and Helsinki plus 50. So let me first of all ask whether anybody else wants to chip in to intervene with uh, also with short comments. And if not, I will go back to the uh, to the panelists, asking them whether they have any final considerations. Uh, after which, we will uh, conclude the session. But then, as I say, we will uh, also issue a uh, um, a perception of uh, uh, the key issues that have emerged from the discussion as a base uh, for uh, further work on this issue uh, towards 2020, uh, 2025. Um, any, anybody wishes to intervene? I, I don't see any signs from, from anybody. So let me then go back to the panelists and ask them whether they have any final uh, thoughts themselves. Unfortunately, uh, Ambassador Bush had to uh, leave us. 
Okay, yeah, I see Kari. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, uh, then we'll, we'll uh, go back to the panelists in the order that they spoke. As I was saying, uh, uh, Ambassador Bush uh, uh, had unfortunately to leave due to another uh, commitment. Uh, the others seem to be uh, still still on. Uh, so let me let, let us check uh, see whether uh, Hedy Fry, are you are you there? Would you like to uh, have a final word on your side? So uh, I, I, we we are not getting a, a reaction from Hedy. So let's try to. Uh... Yeah, I can you hear sure. me? Because I'm having some trouble also with my. Uh, okay. Connection. Okay. Can you hear go me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you very well. So go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, because I was also having problems. Uh, I just want to maybe say as a final word, really, that uh, that uh, at CPC we're of course extremely happy to uh, coordinate and cooperate with the parliamentary assembly on these matters as on everything else. So, so really, just I think from my side, a very uh, very great thank you for uh, inviting me to this because it's an important agenda topic. It's something to be mainstreamed into into everything uh, for the reason that we've heard and the reasons that we already of course knew and so uh so let's keep in touch that would really be my final words on this thank you so much uh, thank you very much Stula. i can only confirm this from my side in fact the, the, the conflict prevention center invited me to attend the annual security review conference only last week and this was a good opportunity also to present initiatives of the parliamentary assembly uh, in the context of uh, uh, action to uh, uh, promote peace and security and uh, and looking also at the role of uh, women so with gender considerations in this context. And of course, this is only the most visible part of the uh, cooperation that also at a personal level is uh, uh, is continuing, is ongoing, and it's excellent, in fact. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tula, for your presence today, for your uh, suggestions your consideration will take a good note and i think they will help us as we uh, as we proceed um uh, so let's see uh, uh, carrie erickson would you have any final uh, comments from your side yes uh, thank you and thank you for the debate and so many interesting uh, issues has been brought to the table and i think for us parliamentarians and also for you when you are um, uh, heading the helsinki plus 50 further on I think it's important to prioritize, to choose some issues or some method or uh, something that you choose to be specific uh, on working uh, with, so that there are not a wide, broad uh, issues uh, lying there and everybody can pick something. I think it's important to to prioritize and to um, to be uh, most. Uh, so as much uh, concrete as you can on what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve it. And I think it was very interesting to hear the Ambassador Yoyora, Yuriola's uh, concrete intervention uh, on how the VPS uh, agenda can be strengthened in the work in Geneva. So I personally think that that's something I would like to look further into as a special representative. And I also have have uh, we are talking about uh, the 1325 uh, commitment and that there were no consensus and i think it's important for us parliamentarians to don't sit and wait for any consensus the other countries that uh, have implemented or that thinks uh, thinks that this is a good way of working i think you just have to act and the last thing i would uh, mention is how we use the language and how we speak about gender issues and i would just like to to give two examples the one is we are speaking about how can we include women that's that's a, a, a phrase we often use but if we 
turn it around and say, how can we stop the exclusion of women? Then you put the responsibility on the society and not on the women. And the other example is we are speaking often about women as vulnerable persons and vulnerable groups. But if we turn it around and say that the, the situations put the women in vulnerable situations, the, the, the surroundings and the politics are putting them in vulnerable situations. Because, and that's what I mentioned with uh, the rewriting of the history, that we often think about women as people who has to be helped to get into society, helped to be parliamentarians, but there is a system stopping them from doing it. And I think we have to have um, some more focus on that there is in fact a system that hindrance uh, full participation on women. So that's that's one of my reflections when I have heard um, heard the debate. And I also think uh, several has mentioned good uh, proposals on how they are working. Both Caucasus, uh, Kazakhstan and Georgia has uh, done tremendous thing, things. I think in the, the political systems to to achieve the 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 ground. Um, uh, what what has to be in place before we can achieve full gender equality, and that is to have the laws and uh, the visions of uh, gender equality in place in the parliaments. That I think is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary, for your uh, um, solid recommendations, I would say. Let me now say a few, a few words myself in conclusion of, uh, uh, of this discussion, while thanking you all for your uh, contribution and for the, for the attendance. We had uh, a pretty large number of attendees, as we always have uh, for our uh, uh, Helsinki Plus 50 meetings, and I was very pleased to see that there was attention and engagement also on this. Um, uh, to me, as I say, we will try to reflect in a, in a perception paper of our own uh, some of the key points. Uh, I, I have uh, uh, put together sort of four clusters of issues. Uh, first of all, uh, the Parliamentary Assembly as being a place where we can uh, facilitate. Uh, but I see, before I conclude, I see a, a heavy fry of time. Um, Heidi, would you like to to have a few final words yourself before before my concluding? We cannot hear you. Sorry. Uh, we talk about women in in um, in peace and security, but I think and I think we all talk about how women are um, sort of victims of. of of conflict and how women suffer from conflict. But I think sometimes, and I, and I want to agree with Carrie here, that if we look at women as people who can be empowered to participate and to make things better, if we look at women as no longer as just victims who needed to be helped and to be moved forward, but as, as powerful people that can move um, the agenda forward in terms of conflict. Um, you know, women, women, I think many women I talk to are tired of being victims. They're tired of being considered to be weak and powerless. I think women would like to be empowered to show, make a space for women at the table. Just make room for them and let them speak. And when they do, you will find that gender equality it's not about men versus women. Uh, gender equality is about looking at how life, uh, the reality of life impacts on men and impacts on women. We must do good, good uh, disaggregated data to find out how that impact occurs. And in every segment in an all of government approach, we can look at it and say, here we go. Actually, men are in some ways discriminated in certain areas. Women have a are the largest discriminated group right now because, of course, uh, for, for all of the years we have never been allowed to participate. And I think that 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 for me, getting good research, good statistical data to show us where the gaps are and where we need to to make a space for women. And so it's not about helping women to find the ability to get there. 
It's about just making a space for them and saying, this is 50, a little over 50% of the population and let's just get them into the at the table and listen and work together, men and women, to make things change. And I think if there's anything I can say, it's to look at it from that perspective. The women have a great deal to offer, a great deal of experience, a great deal of expertise. And, and if I may be so bold as to use a very trite example, I am sitting where I am. I am seeing all of you. And therefore, my perspective, my, vi my visual perspective of you are very different from how you are seeing me. And so if we took those two perspectives, the one that men have and the one that women have, and we bring them together, we get a whole perspective and we also get better solutions. And, and this is why we want to see gender equality. We want women to be at the table and say, we can, we will just make room for us. And who is going to make room for us? Men, because you have occupied the space for such a long time. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Alberto. Thanks to you, Heidi. And uh, uh, Kari was making a similar point. Just make it happen. And, uh, you know, some, some goodwill and, and this, uh, 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 this will, in fact, happen. So, as, as I was saying, I, um, uh, from, from the discussion, I, I brought out four, four areas that I would like to highlight. Uh, one, uh, best practices. There, there are a number of good practices in various places. I think the, the Parliamentary Assembly and every, in a way, forum in the OSC can be a good forum uh, to inform each other of successes and of uh, uh, mechanisms, the work of practices that work. So, having uh, good information of what works and try to uh, uh, encourage others uh, to follow the positive examples is, is one way. Uh, second, we uh, heard about work that is done in the OSC in various areas uh, to promote uh, better inclusion of every aspect of the society. I could refer back to uh, uh, Christoph Kamp's uh, uh, reference to the uh, recommendations of the High Commission on National Minority to go in the direction of creating inclusive societies. And Odir is working also uh, on, on the same issues. When you talk about inclusive societies, it's not only inclusive vis a vis minorities or vis a vis specific uh, 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 groupings, but it's also inclusive from a gender perspective. So there is a very easy uh, an applicability to gender of uh, uh, legislation that goes in the direction of creating more inclusivity in societies. So taking, taking into account the recommendations that already exist, uh, looking at how parliamentarians can uh, pass better legislation, more balanced legislation that opens the way uh, for women and for a more balanced representation of society, for a stronger presence of women in every aspect of uh, uh, life of the country. And this automatically will put women also in stronger position in uh, roles that uh, help promote uh, peace and security. The third uh, set of issues is monitoring implementation. I think it's important also for parliaments to look uh, how this legislation is implemented. Often we see good pieces of legislation in the past, but they're not much happening because of bureaucratic resistance or whatever else. Uh, so having also uh, parliamentarians, and I think this is a recurring theme in the overall Helsinki Plus 50 process of how can parliamentarians question a bit more the government on implementation of policies that are emerging from the OSC. And here, we're not talking about creating a new policy on, as I think Kari was pointing out, on 1325, the resolution is there and the commitments of governments are already there. It's a matter of seeing how they are implementing, what is the final result. And, and the final uh, cluster of issues that I have is the uh, support and the follow-up of individual initiatives taken by different parts of the OSC. We heard initiatives about uh, education and the inclusion of you know, the scholarships that, uh, that were mentioned and the projects or the, the projects or field operations, etc. It's important to uh, bring parliamentarians closer uh, to these initiatives to ensure that they are better followed up, that they become more sustainable and they do have an impact, the longer term impact. So there are lots of things that the organization does. Let's support it. Let's try to uh, have a more strategic vision of all of all these little pieces and, and initiatives that are taking place 
and make sure that they are sustained, that they are followed up, that they are well resourced. But resources is another uh, point that I heard coming up a few times in, in the discussion. Uh, and, and putting the resources in the, in the right place is a strong way of uh, uh, um, ensuring the effectiveness of policies uh, aimed at uh, uh, promoting better gender balance in, in these initiatives. So, as I say, uh, we we'll try to structure along these lines uh, some, uh, uh, you know, final perception on our side, and then we'll see how to uh, reflect this and how to work uh, uh, on these things. We will work uh, on uh, uh, issues related to uh, uh, women, business, security, also in close coordination with Heidi Fry as in a role as the special representative uh, on these issues for the Parliamentary Assembly, but also we'll continue uh, engaging with the uh, uh, institutions and the Secretariat uh, uh, where there are so many initiatives. Uh, to make sure that there is a coherence and that the work of the Parliamentary Assembly uh, is uh, well in line with the overall action uh, of the OSC in this, uh, in this field. So I would like this uh, to uh, thank you very much for uh, your attendance, for your contribution to the discussion. It was rich, it was interesting, and uh, uh, I look forward to uh, uh, continuing working with you on these and on other issues in the longer term in the context of this uh, Helsinki Plus 50 process. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Have a, have a good day to you, Henry. And thank you for joining us early in the morning. And uh, thanks to everybody else. Uh, and look forward to continuing the discussion uh, on, the, on the next topic, which will be you at the end of the month.